Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. Your business, you need to think of it as a valuable asset it is and build it so you can sell it one day because this is your nest egg. This is your retirement fund. You know, nothing lasts forever. A lot of times business owners are like, I'm never going to sell my business. Nothing lasts forever. We don't last forever. <laughs> what goes up, what, go, what comes down. You know, you're either growing or dying. And even if you decide not to sell your business, at least if you built your business as if you were going to sell it, you're going to have a much more profitable business that can run without you. And if you do need to sell, you'll actually have a sellable asset. Welcome back. I hope your week's been awesome so far. Now, if you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with leadership master coach Catherine Canty and with doctor turned marketer Johnson Emmanuel, then do go check them out and listen in. They're well worth listening to. But stay here and listen to today's episode first. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Michelle Seiler Tucker, the founder and CEO of Seiler Tucker Incorporated. Michelle holds the Mergers and Acquisitions Master Intermediary title, as well as Certified Mergers and Acquisitions Professional and Certified Senior Business Analyst titles. Michelle also owns many other businesses in several different industries. As a 20-year veteran in the mergers and acquisitions industry, she's regarded as the leading authority on buying, selling, fixing and growing businesses. She and her firm have sold over a thousand businesses in almost every vertical and have a remarkable track record of success. In our conversation today, Michelle talked to me about why it is important to plan your exit strategy from the business from day one using her GPS model. We talked about her six P's, people, product, process, proprietary assets, patrons, and profit. And she explained her three magic questions based on what business we are in. Without further ado, then let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Michelle Seiler Tucker. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited today to have on the InnovaBuzz podcast all the way from New Orleans in the USA, Michelle Seiler Tucker, who is regarded as a leading authority on buying, selling, fixing, and growing businesses. Michelle's a best-selling author, and she's host of the Exit Rich podcast. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Michelle. It's a real privilege to have you here as my guest. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Now, your latest book, uh, Exit Rich, same name as the podcast, is provides lots of insights into building sustainable, scalable, and sellable businesses, and it works through all the techniques that you've built over the, your many years in that field. But before we start talking about all things businesses, growing, building and selling businesses, what, what is it that drives you and how does that shape what you do? I think what drives me is, is just entrepreneurship. I love business. I love, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I love to find out how someone <laughs> started, you know, a $50 million company out of their pickup truck or, you know, from their garage or their kitchen table. I'm working with a client right now whose business we're going to sell for about $70 million. And he's got an eighth grade education, but he 
started his business out of his pickup truck. <laughs> and they do about $75 million in revenues and about $12 million in EBITDA. So stuff like that just gets me all fired up. I love ownership. I, I love business ownership. I love business entrepreneurship. And I just love everything business. Mm. So the whole idea of uh, building something from essentially nothing and, and growing it into something that has huge value. Yeah, that excites me. You know, it, it really does because it just, you know, goes to show that, well, not just America, Australia too, but the dream is alive and well, right? You can pretty mm. much create your own destiny and write your own script and be whatever you want to be. Mm. Yeah, I've got right, business right. owners that have have grown, you know, huge wealth from just starting from an idea, from a concept. Mm. That's fascinating. Now, this is your second book, the um, book Exit Rich. So why did you write that book? So I wrote Exit Rich because lots of reasons. But one of the biggest reasons is when I wrote Sell Your Business for More Than It's Worth in 2013 and did the research, I realized that the business landscape has changed dramatically. It used to be back in 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, that 95% of all startups will go out of business. So all startups will go out of business. 95%. One to five years is the greatest risk. However, when I wrote Exit Rich in 2019, 2020, I realized that the business landscape has changed dramatically. And this was before the pandemic. So now only 30% of startups will go out of business. Only 30%. However, out of 27.6 million companies, those businesses that have been around for 10 years or longer, 70% of those businesses are at risk for going out of business. 70%. And these business owners are exiting poor. They're selling for pennies on the dollar, closing their business, or even worse, filing bankruptcy. In America, when you file, file bankruptcy, you don't just lose your business assets, you lose your personal assets too, because most business owners pierce the corporate veil. Hmm. And so you hear about the big public companies all the time. I'm sure you hear about this in Australia. Toys R Us in business 75 years goes out of business. Yeah. J.C. Penney's is in trouble. Montgomery Ward, Sears, Steinmark goes out of business. Pier One goes out of business. Jamboree goes out of business. Um, Godiva, our favorite chocolate, closes 1,500 locations. GNC is closing down 900 locations. But what you're not hearing about are all the private companies on every street corner and every mm -hmm. town and every state across the USA. And like I said, these business owners are dropping like flies and exiting poor. So the reason why I wrote Exit Rich is to help business owners because Steve Forbes also says 80% of businesses will never sell. Eight out of 10 businesses do not sell. And so I wrote Exit Rich to help business owners, number one, plan their exit strategy from day one of starting or buying a business. Number one. Number two, build a solid infrastructure on what I call running on all six cylinders, all the ST six P's so that you can build a sustainable business that you can scale. And when you're actually ready, you'll have a sellable asset. Hmm. And that's why I wrote Exit Rich. Most business owners never think about selling until an internal catastrophic event has occurred. Internal meaning health issues, partner disputes, divorce, death, external COVID. Yeah. You know, and that's the worst time to sell your business because your business is typically trending downward and you'll never be able to maximize value. The best time to sell your company is when your company is doing well and it's in its prime. Hmm. So that's why I wrote Exit Rich is to really educate business owners that you have to change your mindset. You have to think about your business differently. It's not your baby. Your baby is your kids at home. Go home and hug and love on your babies. Your business, you need to think of it as a valuable asset it is and build it. So you can sell it one day because this is your nest egg. This is your retirement fund. You know, nothing lasts forever. A lot of times business owners are like, I'm never going to sell my business. Nothing lasts forever. We don't last forever. <laughs> what goes up, what, go, what comes down. You know, you're either growing or dying. And even if you decide not to sell your business, at least if you built your business as if you were going to sell it, you're going to have a much more profitable business. Yeah. that can run without you. And if you do need to sell, you'll actually have a sellable asset. 
Most business owners go to sell their business and they don't have a sellable asset because they never built a business that a business owner actually, that a buyer actually wants to buy. Most business owners go out and create a glorified job in which yeah. to go to work at every day mm. rather than a business that actually works for them. So Exit Rich is all about building a business that works for you and building it on the infrastructure of the six Ps. Mm. Yeah, I, I like that. It's, I mean, it's a different mindset to think about selling the business straight up front when you're just starting it, isn't it? But uh, there's a couple of key points in what you've said there. And, you know, that applies to any business, I think, regardless of whether you're thinking of selling right then and there or not. And that's uh, building a business that serves you rather than a glorified job. And right. also the, the idea of an asset and having the systems and processes in place that makes it a, a profitable asset. Right. I mean, just think about it. We plan for everything else in our life. You know, if we have kids, we plan where they're going to go to preschool, where they're going to go to kindergarten, elementary, you know, middle school, high school, college, who they're going to marry, how many kids they're going to give us. You know, we do estate planning and we reverse engineer and say, okay, well, we want to be able to live on, you know, maybe want to, want to be able to live on $20,000 a month, $240,000 a year. And the financial advisor will say, well, this is what you need to do to get to a point where you're going to live on $20,000 on $20, a month. Well, it's the same thing with your business. You need to plan for it, for your end game, figure out what your desired sales price is and reverse engineer it, just like you would your your wealth plan. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but nobody so thinks about their business and plans hmm. their business for an exit. They think about everything else in their life but their business. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit short term sometimes with the business, isn't it? Now, you touched on... Um, the 6p method to kind of get your business ready for for sale from day one and i know from looking at the book and going through all the documentation you've put online that there's a lot there that is actually really important to get a, a good business running even when you're not thinking about selling but changing the mindset to building it so that somebody else can just step in and take over is, is almost automatically positioning it for sale. Tell us a little bit more about that 6P method and, and what's critical for a business owner to have in place. I'm happy to tell you about the 6Ps, but before I do, let's start with the GPS exit model because this is where all business owners have to start. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. So first and foremost, I want business owners to think about, well, Think about this. When you want to drive somewhere, what's the first thing you do? You pull out your phone, you go to Google Maps, and you plug in what? Yeah, you plug in your destination. You plug in your destination. You know where you're going. If you don't know where you're going, you're going to drive around in circles and drive your wife crazy, right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> Same thing with a business owner. Business owners don't plan to fail. They fail the plan. And so business owners end up driving around in circles, up and down the financial hill to end up nowhere, to end up broke or in bankruptcy court. So business owners have to start with a destination. From day one of starting or buying your business, you can always tweak this. But I want business owners to think about what's my destination, what's my desired sales price, and pick a number. And a lot of times business owners get hung up on a number, but just pick a number. Say you want to sell for $10 million. Great, there's a number. Now what does the GPS need to know after it knows your destination? It needs to know where you're starting from. What is your current location? And in other words, what's your current evaluation? What is your business worth today? So that, and I don't know if you know this, but most business owners have never had an evaluation done on their business. <laughs> they have no idea what their most valuable asset is worth. You know, we go to the doctor once a year to make sure our heart's still ticking and we're still kicking. We drive our car to the shop to make sure we get an annual, you know, tune-up on our, on our automobile. But our most valuable asset, which is our business, we never get an evaluation, an annual evaluation checkup. There are events that increase valuation, events to decrease valuation. COVID is a perfect example of that. So all business owners need to know what their business is worth every single year. It's financial suicide not to know these numbers. So let's say you want to sell for 10 million, that's your destination. Your current location, current valuation is a million. Now let's say, what do you need to know next? You need to know time frame. When do you want to sell for $10 million? Let's say you want to do it in 10 years. Then the next thing you need to know are buyers. Who are my buyers going to be? Now, you notice I say buyers and not buyer. Mm. 
a lot of clients come to me and say, oh, Michelle, I just need you to represent me. I already have the buyer. And I'm like, no, because in all likelihood, that buyer is not going to close on the sale of your business. <laughs> and then we have no backup buyers. Mm. You never want to put all your, all your eggs in one buyer's basket. Plus, you, how are you going to maximize value if you can't create competition? How do you create competition with one buyer? You don't. So you want to make sure you have buyers. And there's five different types of buyers. So if you're trying to sell a $10 million company, you're not going to sell to a first-time buyer. 90% of buyers are first-time buyers. They don't buy $10 million companies. Yeah. You're not going to sell to a distribution, to, to a, um, a, a um, turnaround specialist because they buy distressed assets. So the third type of buyer is private equity groups. And then number four is strategic slash competitors. And they typically pay the highest multiple because they buy synergies. And then the last type of buyer is a sophisticated entrepreneur that's industry agnostic. They chase cash flow. So then the next thing you need to know was back, you need to reverse engineer and say, okay, where do my numbers need to be? If I'm going to appeal to those three types of buyers, private equity groups, strategic competitors, and sophisticated entrepreneurs, where's my gross revenue needs to be? Most importantly, where's the EBITDA have to follow? EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. If you want to sell for $10 million, you're going to have to have an EBITDA of at least $2 million. Okay? Mm. And then... You need to know, well, what synergies are these buyers looking for? What are they willing to pay top dollar for and outbid everybody else on? And then, the, and then that's how you build on the six Ps, and that's how you yeah. build your proprietary assets. And then obviously the last equation in that GPS exit model is my why. Why do I want to sell for $10 million? If it was easy, wouldn't everybody be doing it? Hmm. So your why needs to be powerful enough, strong enough, to keep you in the game and keep you motivated to weather all the financial storms. Yeah. So you need to start with the GPS exit, then go into the six Ps. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much a marketing exercise, isn't it? Sort of knowing what you want to achieve and finding out who the ideal buyer is and understanding what drives the ideal buyer and what you need to give them. Exactly. Exactly. It's kind of like when you set up your business to begin with and you're selling a widget. You're selling a widget. You need to identify who's your ideal buyer to buy this widget, hmm. <laughs> right? What, how old are they? What's the demographics? You know, male or female? Who is your ideal client to buy this widget? It's not going to be everybody. Hmm. So that's the first thing you do when you go into business is find out who your ideal target market is, who your ideal client is. Same thing with selling your business. You need to identify who your buyers are going to be where the financials need to be, and most importantly, what synergies are they looking to purchase? Yeah. Yeah. So d tell us more about that concept of synergies. Yeah, so let's get into the six Ps because the six Ps explain synergies. Okay. So the first P, the most important P, the number one reason that businesses are not sellable, well, I'm going to say number two reason. The first reason is because business owners haven't built an actual business that buyers want to buy. They built themselves a job. And so the big reason that businesses don't sell is because a business is a thousand percent dependent upon the owner. Mm -hmm. I pulled that owner out of the business. There is no business. I had a sweet little old lady call me the other day. Her husband dro dropped dead of a heart attack. He had been in business for 45 years. He never planned an exit strategy. So she asked me, she said, he left me with a mountain of debt. Can you help me sell the business? I started asking questions. He had no people. He had no processes. Everything was in his head. When he died, the business died. Hmm. So if you're not going to set up your exit strategy for yourself, set it up for your loved ones. <laughs> hmm. But the first P is people. You don't build a business. You build people and people build the business. So entrepreneurs have to stop trying to do it all. You will never grow unless you let go of control. Hmm. And so you have to focus on your strengths, hire your weaknesses, and put the right people in the right spot. Put the right people in the right seat and ask the who question. Who opens the door? Who handles customer service, accounting, legal, marketing? You know, who handles quality control, manufacturing, transportation, environmental? The clue is that you should never be next to the who. Hmm. Because you want to build a business to run without you. I had a dentist come to me the other day. He's been in business for 50 years. One dentist, three dental hygienists. And guess what? All three dental hygienists are his family members. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you're going to have to stay around for a couple of years. And he goes, I'm not staying. I said, well, if you're not staying, you're not selling. 
Because when you go, the patients go. Yeah. All right. So people is probably the most, one of the most important P's is you got to have the right people. The second P is product. This is your industry. This is your service. This is your product. You have to ask yourself, is your industry, your product, your service on the way up or on the way out? Are you thriving or is it dying? Do you have an Amazon and you're in your prime? Or do you have a blockbuster and you're about to go bust? Hmm. <laughs> and unfortunately, a lot of industries are going bust right now because of this pandemic, this worldwide pandemic. So if you're in an industry that's dying, that doesn't mean that you pack up and go home <laughs> and file bankruptcy. That means you got to ask yourself three transformational questions. Amazon did this in the 90s. They asked themselves, number one, what business are we in? Hmm. And I said, oh, we're in a book selling business. We, we sell books. We fulfill book orders. Question number two, and all of your listeners should be doing this. What do we do really well? What do we do better than everybody else? What is our core competencies? And Amazon said fulfillment. We're really good at fulfillment. We're better than everybody else at fulfillment. And then question number three, the most important question is what business should we be in? Yeah. What business should we be in? And Amazon said, we should be in a fulfillment business. We should be fulfillment yeah. products worldwide for everybody, not just for authors and publishing houses. Mm -hmm. So those three transformational questions transform that Amazon from a small bookseller to the multi-billion dollar worldwide conglomerate that they are today. Yeah, I love I love those three questions because um, it it sort of my background in my early corporate career was in photography when the film photography. Um, or when digital photography first launched onto the consumer market. And I lived mm -hmm. through from inside one of the big film manufacturers, their response to that change. And, you know, for me, the, as a young man, the writing was on the wall, and yet they didn't ask those questions. And I, I thought, you know, this is the most logical thing here. It's, okay, we're in this, we're in the film business, but we're not asking ourselves, what do we actually do for customers? Because it's not providing film, it's providing them a means to capture memories. Exactly. So you're in the memory business. Mm. You're in creating memories that last a lifetime. Right? You're not in the yeah. photography business. That's right. So, yeah. So those questions are really important. It's, it's important for business owners to get out of being transactional and start becoming transformational. Mm. Business owners need to work on their business, not in it. Yep. Makes sense. And then the third P is processes. So processes are kind of like exit strategy. You don't think about them until something bad happens. <laughs> and you're like, oh, we need a process for that. <laughs> yeah. I, have, I have a client who's, um, who's, oh my gosh, they have a lot of unhappy clients, a lot of unhappy customers. So mm. the customers went on the internet and just really started bashing them. And it's really hurt their business. And the owner says, we need a policy and procedure for customer service and, you know, I'm like, yeah. yeah, you needed that before. <laughs> now you got to do damage control. So processes should be thought of from the beginning of buying or starting your company. And most people get this wrong. Most business owners mm. get this wrong. They think about processes based upon their agenda, the owner's agenda, what the, what the owner's trying to accomplish. That's, that's inaccurate. You need to think about your processes based upon your customer experience. Mm. Like the McDonald brothers. Did you ever watch the movie, The Founder? Yes, yeah. That's... You remember that movie? Mm. So you got the two McDonald brothers, and then you got Ray Kroc, who came in and blew McDonald's up and took McDonald's, right? So McDonald brothers back in the 1950s said, we want to create a fast food restaurant, and we want to create the processes, because nobody had a fast food restaurant back then. They said, we want to create the processes around the customer experience. We want customers to experience great tasting food that's hot, fast, 30 seconds or less. And do you remember they went to the empty tennis courts and took all their employees and took chalk and drew out the processes on the mm. tennis court? Yeah, yeah. And then one of the brothers, I think his name was, I don't know, the little one, Mac or Dick, I can't remember, but he got up on the ladder and he was orchestrating, you know, where everybody should move and what they should be doing. And he really created this symphony of systems and processes that even though they've been tweaked along the way, you can eat at McDonald's in Australia, USA, mm. Russia, wherever, and still get the same experience. Get the same experience, yeah. And they can replace somebody like that because they have the SOP checklist, mm. they have policy and procedure manuals, 
So they can literally put somebody in to run the cash register and have them trained in 30 minutes, you know? Um, so your processes have to be designed with the customer experience in mind. So many business owners do the opposite. Have you ever dealt with a company and you're trying to get your issue resolved and you have to push this button and talk to this person yeah, and this yeah. button and this oh, button yeah. and this button? And then you get five different people on the phone and you have to tell your story five times. Five oh, times, yeah. And oh, at yeah, the end, yeah. you're like, oh my gosh, I'm done. I never want to do business with this this company yeah. again because I the have that is, so much. Yeah. yeah and and I always is, say, haven't these people gone through their own processes as a customer? <laughs> exactly. Mm. Exactly. Because your processes are designed to create raving fans, mm. happy clients, happy customers. To des they're designed to create wow experiences. But so many processes do just the opposite. They infuriate customers. Mm. They create raving haters <laughs> that <laughs> want to destroy your company. So you really need to go back to the bases and ask yourself, what do you want your customers to experience? Mm. And then develop your processes around the customer's experience. Now, they should be productive. And they should be efficient so they don't cost you money, your processes. Because processes, lack of processes can break a company. You know, you got to make sure you have that quality control as well. And you want to make sure you have policy and procedure manuals, SOP checklists, standard operating procedures. You want to make sure that you have employee handbooks, non-competes, employee agreements, and really paper the company. Because when you go to sell it, the first thing that a buyer asks in due diligence is to see yeah. all your policy and procedure manuals. That's right. And, you know, it comes back to what you were saying earlier about the business owner shouldn't be, his name shouldn't or her name shouldn't be against the any of the job descriptions or positions mm -hmm. within the company with the people. And the way you do that is you have processes that you use to train other people to do those jobs. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a business owner really has to figure out what are their strengths? You know, what can they do that nobody else really can do? You know? Mm -hmm. I write my books because nobody else can write my books. I tried yeah. hiring a ghostwriter and it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so the next P, well, let me talk a little bit about valuation. So companies that have a, have a million dollars, under a million dollars in EBITDA in the United States, I don't know about Australia, will typically trade for anywhere from one to four times EBITDA. Hmm. EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Companies that have over a million in EBITDA will typically trade for four, five, and up. This fourth P is called proprietary. These are your proprietary assets. Proprietary assets can take you to a seven multiple, an eight multiple, a 10, a 12. So you really want to pay attention to this P. <laughs> hmm. There's six pillars to proprietary. So I'll explain them really quickly. First and foremost is branding. So let me explain let me explain the branding ladder really quickly. There's five steps in the branding ladder. Businesses typically go most businesses in the United States, probably about 90% of businesses live in what I call brand absence. Brand absence. That means the consumers don't know who they are and what they do. They might purchase from them because they stumbled across them, but they're living in brand absence. Meaning nobody really knows who they are. Hmm. Then you go from brand absence to the second step on the ladder to brand awareness. This is where more consumers know who you are and what you do. Then you want to go from brand awareness to brand preference. This is where I would say I prefer Diet Coke over Pepsi. Yeah. I prefer Apple over Android. You know? And then you go from brand preference to brand Insistence. I've been to a lot of hotels because I'm a speaker and I've, spe I've spoken all over the country. And I always ask them when we go to lunch, hey, I, I want a Diet Coke. I'm like, is Pepsi okay? No, Pepsi is not okay. If Pepsi was okay, I would have ordered a Pepsi. Hmm. <laughs> so brand insistence is where you say, I only drink Coke. I only use Apple products. I only yeah. buy Xerox copiers. You follow me? Yeah. That's brand assistance. And then you go from brand assistance, assistance to brand advocacy. This is the highest level of branding you can get to. Brand advocacy is when you tell someone, 
go Google this. Hmm. Go Xerox this. Chill out, have a Coke. <laughs> yeah. You know? And so brand advocacy is the highest form of branding that you can possibly get because it's always better when somebody else sells you than when you sell yourself. Hmm. I tell all of my people, go get an Apple. Don't don't go get an iPhone. Don't get anything but an iPhone. So branding is huge because you can sell your business for a lot of money as long as your brand is relevant in the mind of the consumers. Is anybody going to pay any money for Blockbuster? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. They're not. The most valuable brand in the world is, do you know? Today. Today. Apple. I would have said Apple. Apple, you're right. Most people mm. get this wrong. Most people say Coke or Amazon or Nike. Mm. But Apple is number one. Apple is worth over $359 billion. Mm. That's just the brand. That's not the cash flow, inventory, assets, real estate, or anything else. That's just the brand. Mm. So build well, your brand. They're... Their loyalty is such that, you know, they announce a new product and say this will be launched tomorrow at midday and then people are queued up for multiple city blocks in front of the Apple store hours before that, at dawn of, of that day. Yeah, you'll never find me in those lines, but, <laughs> you know, they're building that because they're building yeah, that, they have that urgency, mm. you know. Um, so that's Apple the customer is loyalty, isn't it? Right. It's customer loyalty. And that's what you want to build is you want to build client loyalty. Hmm. So branding is huge. Um, trademarks are big. You know, having trade, trademark your company name, trademark your logo, your slogan. The problem in the United States is that business owners will go state of California, set up their business, they get a trademark in the state of California, but they never check the federal database to make sure that company name is available. So I've seen clients be in business for 10, 15, 20 years. And all of a sudden, receive a sys letter, and they have to stop doing business as that company name. And they'll hire an attorney, throw a bunch of money at it, but in most cases, they'll lose. So they got to start all over from scratch. So go get a federal trademark. It's not that expensive. And, you know, you should federal trademark your podcast. I federal trademark my book, Exit Rich. Federal trademark your slogan, your logo, your USP. We are selling the company right now in the $70 million range, and they've got 15 different exclusive products. And each product is exclusive to a certain grocery store chain. And each product has a, a federal trademark. Hmm. This drives value. Synergistic buyers will pay more money for that. Patents are another big one that raises the multiple. You know, if you've ever watched Shark Tank, every investor asks every single investor, do you have a patent? Do you have a patent penny? Do you have a utility patent? And their offer is contingent upon you proving that you actually have the patent. Hmm. We sold a business for $18 million. It wasn't making that much money, but they had 18 patents. And then real um, contracts are very important. Manufacturing agreements, distribution agreements, vendor contracts, any type of exclusivity contracts, franchise or contracts that have franchisees. The most valuable contracts of all are client contracts because buyers want to know that they're buying a business with revenue coming in. Especially if the contracts have a subscription model with free occurring revenue. Hmm. But here's a caveat to contracts. In the United States, I don't know about Australia, you need that two cent transferability clause that says this contract is transferable on the new entity. Because 98, 99% of deals in America are asset sales, not stock sales. So if the buyer doesn't agree to do a stock sale and your clients don't agree to a consent to transfer, then your deal could fall apart. I once knew an M&A firm that sold to a private equity group. They have 1,500 franchisees. So the private equity firm had the due diligence team. Nobody really looked at the contracts. None of the contracts with the franchisees were transferable. So the private equity group set up this huge meeting, celebratory meeting, and the franchisees didn't like the, the private equity group. They thought, you don't have any experience. You're arrogant. You don't know our industry. Mm -hmm. We're not going to trans. We're not going to consent to transfer. One franchisee out of 1,500 agreed to transfer. This private equity group filed bankruptcy within 90 days. Mm -hmm. And then they sued their entire legal team. <laughs> so <laughs> make sure you have that transferability clause. Celebrity endorsements are really big. Really big. You know, um, if you've watched Rooms to Go commercial in the U.S., I got Cindy Crawford. Hmm. You know, we have a client um, that has products in front of Oprah. 
strategic independents will pay a lot of money for those businesses because they want to get their products in front of Oprah. She's the queen of everything. Yeah. You know, so they'll pay more money. Radio personalities are also big. You don't see radio personalities or like Sydney Crawford. Sydney Crawford doesn't put her name on more than one furniture company. <laughs> hmm. So they, have, they, they support one vertical at a time. So that's what we call prime real estate. And then also for e-commerce businesses, oh, well, let me back up a minute and talk about databases. If you have a database and your clients have been nurtured and they can be retargeted and repurposed, that's worth a lot of money. Facebook paid $19 billion for WhatsApp. And WhatsApp was hemorrhaging. But they had a synergy. So all of these things we've been talking about are synergies. Yeah. They had a billion users and Facebook knew they could monetize an ROI on the sale of that business. They wanted those billion users. They paid $19 billion for a billion users. Hmm. And then e-commerce businesses, when you have any of the top three to five positions on Wayfair, Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Modern, that's worth a lot of money to strategics. So these are your propri proprietary assets that can really drive value and get you a much higher multiple. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, there's there's so much to think about there, isn't there, and plan for. But, um, you know, you've touched on a couple of things there that I think a lot of businesses um, ignore or uh, when when something happens that they think, oh, maybe we should patent that or maybe we should trademark our brand. It's, it's often too late. Yeah. The fifth fee is, yeah, it is often too late. The fifth fee is patrons. This is your customer base. In America, most businesses follow the 80-20 rule where 80% of their business comes from 20% of their clients and they have customer concentration. Customer concentration is very scary to buyers. <laughs> you know, we had an oil manufacturing business we were selling and the company had 65, 70% of their revenue tied up in a BP contract. It appraised for about 9.8 million. We had over 550 buyers look at this business. We narrowed it down to 12 buyers that gave us letter of intent. Out of those 12, they all had some type of condition about the PP contract. And my owner didn't want to take a condition. So I found a buyer, Strategic, who has similar products and services. They have been trying to get their, their products and services in the BP for decades and can never get inside BP. They said, if we buy this business, we're going to get our company in there and it'll catapult our company to the next level. So they offered and paid $15 million for 70% of the business for a business that appraised for 9.8. They paid 126% more than their appraised price because they wanted that BP contract. So when we're doing evaluations and we're working with our clients, you know, we do evaluations on six different methods. One of the biggest methods are these six Bs yeah. because we know we can identify the buyers that are willing to outbid everybody else and pay for synergies. We know the buyers that can take advantage of economies of scale and the buyers that can cut costs by cutting some infrastructure because they already have the infrastructure. So they can increase EBITDA from day one. Hmm. Makes sense? It, yes, yeah, certainly does. Yeah. So the last P, the most important P to all entrepreneurs is profits. Everybody's <laughs> in business to make money. The reason why I put profits last is because profits, lack of profits is never the problem. If you're not making money, it's not the problem. <laughs> it is a symptom of not operating one of the other five Ps. I have mm. clients that come to me all the time and say, Michelle, I have a profit problem. I'm like, no, you have a people problem. Mm. No, you have a process problem. You do not have a profits problem. Profits is a symptom. I have one guy come to me and say, Michelle, I'm losing money. I'm losing money. I go, who's in charge of your accounting? Who's in charge of your checkbook? And he showed me and I said, she's stealing from you. That's why you're losing money. <laughs> you you got to trust but verify. You got to inspect what you expect. And so lack of profits is never the problem. It's always a symptom. Hmm. That was your six piece. Yeah. Fascinating. That That's, um yeah. And, you know, you've really highlighted why they're so important and, uh, there's so much to think about there in terms of building those processes to sell and, and having all those different pillars in place. Absolutely. Hmm. Well, this is fascinating, Michelle. I, uh, we could uh, dig so much more into this, but I'm just looking at the time and watching that and aware of um, your commitment. So I think it's a good point now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round with our scripted questions, five questions that 
are designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. And they probably will circle back to the whole idea of building businesses to scale and sell. So I've got five questions. Hopefully you'll inspire the listener to go and do something awesome and take action as a result today. Hopefully I will. (laughs) The pressure, the pressure. (laughs) (laughs) And then we're going to tell all of your listeners how they can get exit rich. Exactly. We'll do that. Now, what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Learn from others outside of your industry. Hmm. I love that. Yeah. Everybody wants to learn from their competitors. <laughs> Go outside of your own circle. Learn what the best companies in the world are doing. What does Disney do differently? Hmm. You know, what does Apple do differently? What does Coca-Cola do differently? Learn from outside your industry to become innovative. Yeah. And it's a little and bit make like sure you ask those transformational questions. I told you. I was just going to, I was just going to link back to that. I think, because I think they're so valuable in terms of chunking it up to a higher level. So, you know, what does mm-hmm. Apple do? Well, I'm, I'm not in the business of making computers, but what can I learn from Apple? And by chunking it up to those sort of questions, it, it gives you ideas from those other businesses. Yeah. Apple was great because Steve Jobs, when he came back to Apple, Apple was, was dying. Hmm. And Steve Jobs came in and really, you know, started asking questions about what business are we in? What do we do really, really well? What business should we be in? They asked themselves the same level of questions, but they also said, you know, we don't want to create what people know they need. We want to be preemptive and create stuff that people can't live without. Hmm. They don't know they need an, a smartphone because nobody has yeah. smartphones back then. They don't need a, they don't know they need an iPad. I remember the first time I heard about an iPad. I'm like, that's the most stupid idea I've ever heard of. <laughs> yeah. And now I have like 12 yeah. of them. Yeah, you, yeah. Know? <laughs> you can't live without it, right? So you got to figure out what, you got to figure out what they need before they even need it and create mm. it. And that's what Steve mm. Jobs did so well. Yeah. yeah, love it. Okay, now what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Learn from others outside my industry and align myself with a mentor. Yeah. Okay. I love it. Okay. Now, do you have a favorite resource you use most often? A favorite resource I use most often. Um, I listen to a lot of CDs and tapes. Um, I'm really big into like law of attraction. So I listen a lot to Bob Proctor Mm -hmm. and, and um, people like Bob Proctor. I would say that's a big resource for me. Um, you know, in my industry, I read all the trade publications to know what's happening in my industry as well. Um, but I always, you know, my big thing, and and I learned this from Jeff Hoffman, who was founder of Priceline. Hmm. And Jeff says, you got to always look at things through a different set of eyes and identify the problem that nobody knows is a problem. Yeah. And he was the founder of the airport kiosk because he stood in line for an hour and a half. And by the time he finally got up to, you know, to the front, to the desk, the airline desk, they gave him his silly little ticket (laughs) to get on the plane. He's like, I just missed my plane. You're telling me I've been sitting here for an hour and a half to get a piece of paper. Yeah. And that experience caused him to go out and create the airport kiosk. Mm. So you really got to look at things and say, gosh, this could be done so much better. And just all of us have the ideas in in us. We really do. We just got to act upon them. Mm, Yeah. And I love Jeff's story. And he he was on the show a while back. So go check out his episode as well. He's a good friend of mine. And he also endorsed Exit Rich. (laughs) (laughs) Great. All right. Now, what's the best way to keep a client on track when as you're working with them to build these systems and the six P's into their business? So the best way for us to keep a client on track is is we have a whole funnel that we that we put our clients in and you know it's all these different touch points, right? Mm. So we'll identify what their bottlenecks are, what their biggest top five, six bottlenecks are. We'll take them through the six P process. But it's all these different touch points as far as making sure that they're hearing, <laughs> listening making sure that they're following our advice and really looking at their numbers too. So we're big into numbers. Hmm. Cause I always say, don't get mad, get the stats. 
<laughs> and numbers don't lie. <laughs> mm. So we're really big at checking everything that they're supposed to be doing and inspecting what we expect from them. And like I said, just many different touch points along the way. Yeah, yeah. So communication, but communication based on the data. The world would be a much better place if everybody communicated better. <laughs> yeah, that's that goes without saying almost, but common, <laughs> common sense isn't so common. So That's right. That's my favorite line. Yeah. All right. Now, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? So, again, I think it goes back to what I said earlier, kind of like when you ask those three questions, like Amazon did. You know, what is my core competency? Hmm. What do we do better than everybody else? And in order to know what you do better than everybody else, you need to identify your strength, but know what your competitors are doing. And again, look into other industries to figure out how you can innovate from other industries to really be unique in your industry. Hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it certainly does. And and I just love those questions and you know, what, what business are we in? What business? I, I like to add the what business are we really in sort of to dig deeper on that, but then look at what are our core strengths and what, what are we really good at and what business should we be in based on that? Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Michelle. This has been really fabulous. Now let's talk about the book. Where can people find out more about the book, get a hold of the book, buy it, and maybe even reach out to you and say thanks for what you've shared with us today? Sure. So, Exit Rich launches in June, but you don't have to wait till June. You can go to ExitRichBook.com, ExitRichBook.com for $24.79. We will email you the digital download immediately so you don't have to wait till June. You can start reading Exit Rich today. We'll mail a hardcover to your doorstep upon launch date to anybody that lives in the United States for no additional charge. Outside the United States, there's additional shipping. We all know that. <laughs> So don't get mad at me if I'm not shipping a book for $24.79 to Australia. <laughs> and then we will give you a lifetime membership, no matter where you live, into the Exit Rich Book Club, where we have video training of me doing deep dives in these different strategies and, and techniques that I've been teaching for the last 20 years, plus documents, documents to run your business, documents to sell your business. So we have sample org charts, employee handbooks, non-competes, policy and procedure manuals, SOP checklist. We have sample LOIs, letter of intent forms, sample purchase agreements, sample due diligence checklist, and sample closing docs. All of these documents are available for your review and your download. These documents will cost you over $30,000 if you want an attorney to recreate. Plus, we will give you a 30-day free membership into Club CEOs, which is an entrepreneur mastermind, where we ask those transformational questions. We have those hot seats and um, Q and A's and we help business owners build a sustainable, scalable, and when they're ready, sellable asset. All of that for $24 and 79 cents at exitrichbook.com. Hmm. Wonderful. Well, we'll have that link in the show notes and there's certainly a lot of value um, in, in that um, purchase. It's not just the book itself. Right. <laughs> and then all your listeners can text Michelle to 888-526, 888-526-5750. All of my social media pops up. If you want to follow me on social media, connect with me on LinkedIn. And our websites pop up as well. Our main website is SilerTucker.com. Mm -hmm. Great. And we'll include all those links in the show notes so people can just uh, click straight through. Now, do you have some parting advice today for our listener, Michelle? Yeah, I think, you know, I always tell business owners that you don't have to do this alone. <laughs> you should always align yourself with a mentor because you don't, it's not what you know that gets you in trouble. It's what you don't know. <laughs> so align yourself with a mentor who's traveled down your, the road you want to travel, learn from their mistakes. Their path will help your path become much shorter and you'll get to success much quicker. So align yourself with a good mentor, not somebody who says they've done it. You want somebody who's actually done it. <laughs> And, and, you know, really, like I said, learn from their mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's always good to not repeat mistakes that others have already made. So. Right. Yeah. Make your own mistakes. <laughs> All right. Now, who else should I get on this show and why? We already had Jeff Hoffman. 
Mm. Um, you should get, um, oh my God, his name just went out of my head. Alex Stern, who was founder of Constant Contact. Okay. And why? Because he's a, he's a brilliant entrepreneur. Kevin Harrington, who wrote, Kevin Harrington, who was original Shark on Shark Tank, he also wrote the foreword for Exit Rich. Sharon Lecter is my co-author for Exit Rich. How many more do you need? <laughs> well, we might come back and get some more later on. So so we'll, <laughs> I think I just we'll, dropped six. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll um we'll get introductions to those folks from you to Alex, Sharon, and Kevin, and and reach out to Sharon, them. Sharon, Kevin, and Alex Stern. Yep. Mm. Great. Well, thanks, Michelle. This has been fabulous. I've really enjoyed this. Really enjoyed digging deeper into the exit rich concept and the idea of all the systems and processes behind that and and why it's so important to consider the sale of your business from day one yep from so day one you. and your exit strategy so you don't become yep. a statistic yep. thank you so much for having me on it was my absolute pleasure all the best for the future and let's stay in touch yes thank you I hope you enjoyed that insightful and valuable conversation with Michelle and took something away from her episode. Now, whether you're planning to sell your business now, in a year or 10 years, setting up these systems and processes adds to the inherent value of your business and benefits you immediately. And I love the sequence of questions, what business are we in? What are we really good at? And what business should we be in? Now I'm curious to know what you took away from Michelle's episode. Go check out the blog post and add your comment below that post. You can find that at innovabiz.co forward slash Michelle Sila Tucker. That is M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-S-E-I-L-E-R-T-U-C-K-E-R. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Michelle Seiler Tucker. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with Michelle, as well as links to the Seiler Tucker website, to her book Exit Rich, to her Exit Rich podcast, her social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about today in our conversation. Now, if you like this episode, if you think it's going to help some other people, then don't keep it to yourself. Share it with the people you think it might help. And Tag me in on that chair because I want to personally thank you for spreading this wonderfully valuable information. Michelle suggested that we have a conversation with her co-author of Exit Rich, Sharon Lecter. Also with author of Mentor to Millions, Kevin Harrington, and with Alec Stern of Constant Contact on future Innova Buzz podcast episodes. So Sharon... Kevin and Alec, keep an eye on your inboxes for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast courtesy of Michelle Seiler Tucker. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got yet more fantastic guests lined up, including the author of Intuitive Marketing, Steve Jenko, and the author of Done by Noon, Dave Ruel. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.